I now call to order the Society's 2,464th meeting in what is now the 151st year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I'm the president of PSW Science, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends, including everyone here in the Powell Auditorium at the Cosmos Club and everyone tuning in on Zoom and on YouTube to tonight's lecture by Andrew Cheng and Andrew Rivkin. This society is grateful to the sponsors of the 2022-2023 lecture series for their support, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and a generous sponsor who has asked to remain anonymous. And we are also grateful to the sponsor of tonight's lecture, PSW member Joe Shulman. I am pleased to announce the following new members. Sophie Nixon, a student interested in medicine, especially in neurology, chemistry, biology, biotechnology, and astronomy, who learned of PSW from general committee member Connor Nixon. Samuel Nixon, a video and media production student interested in environmental sciences, chemistry, and space who also learned a PSW from general committee member, Connor Nixon. <laughs> Brad Calvin, founder and CEO of Aceta Sciences, broadly interested in life sciences, especially cell biology, toxicology, drug discovery, and gene editing, who learned a PSW from PSW's president and program chair, Larry Milstein. And Rexwell Minnis, director of software engineering at Capital One, interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence, distributed systems, and cloud computing, and quantum computing, who learned of PSW through LinkedIn. And tonight's speakers, Andy Chang and Andy Rifkin, who learned of PSW from our invitation to them to speak tonight, and whose interests will be clear in part from tonight's lecture. We welcome them to membership. If you're not a member, and would like to join PSW or support the society you can do throw through the PSW website using the blue join button on the upper right hand corner of the home page. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2463rd meeting and the lecture by Bindu Nair on the Endless Frontier Basic Initiatives, Basic Research Initiatives at DOD. James, the stage is yours. Thank you, Larry. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. On September 23rd, 2022, from the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC, streaming online via Zoom and the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 2,463rd meeting of the Society to order. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. The Director for Special Projects then read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Bindu Nair, Director of Basic Research at the U.S. Department of Defense. Her lecture was titled, The Endless Frontier, the DOD Basic Research Initiative. The speaker cited the 1945 book, Science, the Endless Frontier, by Vannevar Bush as the blueprint for modern government funding of basic scientific research. Bush advocated for basic science as the cornerstone to national security, health, and both economic and cultural progress. In 1946, the Office of Naval Research was founded and quickly became a major funder of academic scientific research. Today, the Department of Defense, or DOD, is the second largest U.S. government funder of academic research and development. DOD's policy states that basic research is, quote, the systematic study directed toward greater knowledge of understanding of the fundamental aspects of phenomena and observable facts, end quote. The speaker believes DOD is unique in the world as a non-civilian funder of research that does not require funded research to have a predictable application. By prioritizing understanding over application, the speaker said research results can answer previously unasked questions. Unlike civilian funded science, DOD does not rely on peer review. 
Because the agency is mission-driven, it relies on program managers who have the flexibility to use peer review as a tool. The speaker said DOD's model allows seemingly wild ideas to germinate and potentially grow that otherwise would fail in a traditional funding regime. The speaker then discussed how DOD's funding program compares to the National Science Foundation. By comparison, DOD disproportionately is the early funder of leading researchers. As an example, the speaker described how DOD was an early funder for the research of Deji Akinwande in his work on digital memory storage. The speaker said these results are evidence that the program manager model works. DOD also provides sustained funding for researchers at later stages of their career. Its largest single invest apologies, its largest single investigator program is a five-year fellowship with up to $3 million for research with potentially extraordinary outcomes. John Rogers received the fellowship in 2009 and developed a new field of bioelectronics. The speaker described how program manager Tristan Nguyen is nurturing a new field of mathematics through a multidisciplinary university research initiative, or Murray Awards, and sponsoring international research. His funding management creates a Murray topic on homotope type theory aimed at reinventing type theory and devising computational methods for generating and validating mathematical proofs. Nguyen's funding management has resulted in commercial applications and is the basis of a new DARPA program. DOD funded ground penetrating radar. The speaker described how DOD funded the technology in the early 1990s for landmine detection and has since grown to applications across both military and civilian spheres. DOD has also sustained funding for quantum computing research for 20 years. The speaker explained that DOD's funding was both early and disproportionate compared to other US government agencies. The speaker said keeping basic research independent is at the heart of DOD's funding approach. She acknowledged the difficulty of maintaining that principle in the context of federal bureaucracy. Since 1985, DOD has prohibited restrictions on the conduct of reporting fundamental research the conduct or reporting of fundamental research that is unclassified. That prohibition extends to restrictions on personnel and publications. The speaker then explained how one of DOD's objectives is funding academic institutions, and one of its purposes is to attract the brightest minds from around the world to the United States. The US funding model is also being exported abroad. The speaker described new work in Australia based on the US funding model. The speaker concluded her lecture with a discussion on the soft power impacts of DOD's basic research funding. She then answered questions from the in-person and online viewing audiences. One member asked via Zoom about whether DOD integrates funding with civilian ph philanthropy. The speaker said that while DOD should do better at communicating with civilian funders, it should not coordinate its funding and compromise its unique program manager model. An in-person member asked the speaker about funding applied math. The speaker said that the math community has recently asked for funding in exploratory math and that DOD is now working on how to understand and fund that want. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. He then adjourned the meeting. The temperature in Washington, D.C. was 20 degrees Celsius. The weather was clear, and the number of people attending in person, 30. Concurrent live stream viewers, 30. And the number of online viewers in the first two weeks of posting, 192. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. It's good to have you back in DC. Hearing no opposition and all in favor, I will accept the minutes as read, and they will be posted to the website in due course. We now turn to tonight's speakers, Andy Chen and Andy Rifkin, and their lecture on the DART mission and saving Earth from asteroid impacts. Andy Cheng is Chief Scientist for Space Science at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and he is co-lead investigator for the double asteroid redirection test known fondly as DART. He previously served as Deputy Chief Scientist for Space Science and NASA's Science Mission Directorate. He was the project scientist for the NEAR mission, and he served as orbital LIDAR scientist on the joint science team for the Japanese Hayabusa mission to asteroid Itakawa. He was a scientist on the Galileo mission, a co-investigator on the Cassini mission, and the principal investigator for the long-range reconnaissance imager, finally known as LORI, on the New Horizons mission. He joined APL in 1983, and he founded the Planetary Exploration Group there in 2004. 
Andrew earned a BS in physics at Princeton University and a PhD in physics at Columbia University. Andy S. Rivkin is a planetary astronomer at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory and also investigation lead for the double asteroid redirection test. His research focuses on near-infrared spectroscopy and spectrophotometry of asteroids. In addition to observational work, he's been active in the broader near-Earth object community, serving on, as a team member on several efforts to understand and report Earth impact hazards and how to mitigate them. He also leads a group studying and reporting to NASA about the most important unknown factors related to human exploration of an asteroid. Asteroid 13743 was named for him in recognition of his work. And he earned a PhD in planetary sciences from the University of Arizona. All questions will be fielded after the lecture during the Q&A session. Andy Rifkin, the stage is yours. Thank you for coming. Obviously, we've had a very exciting couple of weeks. Happy to share what we can share. Uh, happy to note there are some things we cannot yet share. Um, but uh, I think since the time I've been here, a media advisory came out from NASA uh, that there's going to be an announcement Tuesday afternoon um, that, that will give some of the things that I can't talk about, but hopefully at least you, you don't have to wait too long for it. Um, so here's what we're, we're talking about here, and, and this is going to be me, part one. Um, so we have three acts. Uh, Andy Chang will come up for act two, and then I'll, I'll return for the, for the glorious finale. Um, not that the act two is not also glorious. Um, so this kind of animation was made before we arrived. This kind of showed roughly what we kind of thought might be happening. There's our spacecraft coming in to hit our asteroid. There's going to be kind of a... Uh, very, you know, the flash, and then look at that very nice symmetrical plume. This is wonderful. It's very easy to understand, very easy, presumably, to interpret if, if that were to have been what happened. Um, it, we'll get to the pictures near the end that show how this may or may not have really looked like what we did. Um, but first, we'll back up and say, why are we even doing this? So every time you see a shooting star, you're seeing an impact. It's a very, very tiny impact uh, almost all the time, but it is an impact. Something like 100 to 300 tons of material impact the Earth every day. Um, and if you go somewhere dark and it's not a meteor shower, uh, even if it's just a random night, you'll see five to 10 of these meteors come in uh, that represent impacts of something you know the size of a grain of sand, millimeter size or smaller. Um, a lot of that material never actually reaches the ground. Uh, and here this. Uh, Let's see if I can get this to work. It seems like it should. So that there, right, of course, that's a streak. You've all seen this. Uh, this is a beautiful view of the VLT uh, in uh, Chile, which is a set of four telescopes that actually have been observing Didymos uh, in the past week or so. Larger things hit the Earth. If this were the only kind of material that hit the Earth, we wouldn't you know, have a mission to do it. Um, some of you might remember uh, in the early 1990s, some poor teenager uh, had her car totaled by a, an asteroid impact. Um, this, um, I, I don't know if that this will play. This could be a movie, so oh yeah, okay. So let's see if, if I hit that, if the movie will play. So this happened on a Friday night over the Northeast United States. A lot of people were watching their kids' high school football games, so had their big bulky 1992 era VCRs, and there was a bright flash, and so we got great video footage of this, uh, this thing. I wonder if I can play it again. Um, Maybe, yes. So a lot of footage like that from all across the uh, northeastern United States, which allowed astronomers to go back and say, okay, from, from this part of the country it looked like that, we know where that building is. From this other viewpoint, 30 miles away, it looked like it was there. From 200 miles away, it was there. And we're able to trace it back to the asteroid belt. Um, and based on the brightness and other things, we're able to say this was uh, about the size of maybe this lectern um, before it entered the Earth's atmosphere. There was an airburst, and as, as noted, it, uh, it hit this, this poor woman's car and totaled it. Um, those of you that might remember, this is now getting into the weeds, but I think, uh, as I understand it, we have the time. Um, there was a, a bit of a, 
she was hoping for a bidding war because now she had a car to pay for that was not covered by any insurance, as you might imagine. Um, but she had this rock that came from space. So she was hoping that you know the longer she kind of dragged it out, the, the higher the price would be. But scientifically, it kind of goes in the other direction where the longer it sits out in someone's fridge, you know, or on their mantelpiece, the less useful it is. So eventually, uh, I think the deal was struck where um, the, the meteorite went to the, probably the University of Arizona somewhere. Uh, the car went on tour. So at, at gem and mineral shows across the country in 1992, including, uh, 1993, uh, including the, the big Tucson gem and mineral show in the spring of 1993, this car was brought around and, and part of, you know, you'd enter, you'd go to the gem show, some of the money would presumably go to the people who bought the car off of, off of her. This, that's an extended anecdote, but okay. Larger things hit the Earth. Uh, less than 10 years ago, if only just a little less than 10 years ago, there was an impact over the city of Chelyabinsk in Siberia. Um, Russian society being what it, it, what it was 10 years ago, no comments on anything else. There are a lot of cameras and dashboards because people wanted to document what was and wasn't happening when they were driving. So once again, there were a lot of cameras that happened to catch this flash across the sky. Um, and I don't know if I have the next slide or not that's relevant, but, um, well, let's, let's, let's go for it. So this, this flash happened. It was caught uh, all over uh, that part of Russia. Again, they were able to work the, the orbit back and say this came from the asteroid belt. Um, it uh, was a probably about 20 to 25 meters in size. I'm terrible at this sort of thing. That's kind of room-sized-ish, maybe a bit, a bit taller, um, a few stories taller. Um, and the flash happened. People went to the windows, looked out the windows to see what that flash was, and then the sonic boom arrived and broke all the windows in town. So something like a thousand people got injured because they were standing at this window that unexpectedly broke from, you know, from this sonic boom. So um, this is, um, I think in historic times, I think this is fair to say, in historic times, the most damage and the most injuries that were caused by an asteroid impact even though it wasn't the largest asteroid impact in historic times. Um, this uh, just shows uh, from this paper um, the, the ground track of the Chelyabinsk impact um, and then the area that was affected, these towns that reported damage, uh, and then areas where meteorites were picked up. You could go to eBay and buy a piece of the Chelyabinsk impactor if you want. Um, it's, not, it's not as expensive as you might think um, to do. Impact happened all over the world, even though the, the big one was there in Siberia, and the biggest one in historic times was also in Siberia. They do hit all over the world. These, uh, these are f fireballs reported, as they say, by U.S. government censors uh, to, to try to, yeah, um, in the last you know, 30 or so years. Uh, this is the Chelyabinsk impactor. Here's the impact energy uh, in, in log of kilotons, uh, and certainly they hit all over, uh, all over the world. So asteroid impacts are an international global problem um, if, if the world is to, is to think about them. There's no one part of the world. It's not like tsunamis where you don't care about them if you live in Kazakhstan or anything like that. They, they can hit anywhere. And there, in fact, is the Chelyabinsk impactor. Um, I'll talk about the frequency there in a moment. There is a large crater in the continental United States, in Arizona. This is uh, commonly called Meteor Crater. Uh, I think the formal name is Barringer Crater for the family that owns the land. Um, there's a little visitor center there. Um, there's a, there are any number of great stories about how um, iron meteorites were found around the periphery in the area, and in the early 20s, um, people bought the land hoping to mine it, assuming, as, as they would, given what they knew in the 20s, that there would clearly be a giant piece of, of pure iron at the bottom of that crater if they could just dig it out. Um, again, as long as I'm telling the, the, the anecdotes here, and I clearly am, um, the, uh, the nascent feel of, of impact uh, physics really got a big boost by the studies that were done 
that uh, by a geologist who went and looked and did the numbers and figured it out and said there's actually not going to be anything under there because it hit fast in the speed of sound and the whole thing was dispersed. But then the people who owned the land and wanted to mine it weren't super happy with with that result. So I think it took a while for, for that result to kind of be rediscovered and published. Uh, but the impact itself was pretty mighty. It was a, a kind of a house-sized object. It was made out of iron, so it was much more massive than a typical rock. And people uh, looking at what, whoops, yeah, looking at what the, the effects would have been in the area, there would have been a fireball out to 10 kilometers, which would have consumed basically anything flammable in that area. Out to 24 kilometers, it would have been very bad for large animals. Um, and then all the way out to even 40 kilometers, there would be hurricane force winds. This impact happened tens of thousands of years ago. Um, so if there were people affected, um, we don't actually know about it. Um, but we can imagine you know, what, happened, what would happen if something like that happened instead of in Arizona, if it happened here. So the crater I showed in the last uh, image is actually about the size of the tidal basin. So um, if you then look at those those areas of fireball and you know bad for animals and and hurricane force winds, it goes all the way out. I live kind of here-ish, um, and of course we are right now sitting you know pretty pretty much there. So the crater itself is is you know utter devastation, and then the fireball and etc. So. Um, this this sort of thing catches people's attention. And when there was the impact over Siberia, certainly uh, that was just the latest in a few different events that made people think, okay, what's, what's out there? Can we do something about them? So the United States has a, has a plan um, for dealing with this. Uh, this is, there is a national near-Earth object preparedness strategy and plan. It has several goals. Um, and uh, DART is going to be you know, relevant to one of these goals, but it's not the only one. Uh, that first one, NEO detection, tracking, and characterization is a very important piece because you can't, um, you can't prevent an impact if you don't know it's gonna happen. The searches that have been done, oh, it looks like I, I do one, one step at a time here. Um, the, the studies that have been done, the surveys that have been done uh, to look at what's out there and how often they happen, um, on the, on the small end, something four meters in size. Again, not super big. I'm, I'm, I'm not great at this. Maybe the size of that, you know, that, that archway there. Um, those happen every year. Those mostly, you know, there's a flash. They're impressive to see if you saw them. They would airburst. Some of the pieces might make it to the ground. Um, there are 500 million of those out there, we think. We found very, 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 very few of them. But really, that's OK, because unless your car happens to be right there, you're probably all right. Um, at the big end, um, you know, 10 kilometers, you know, that's sort of at the size where you might, you might start to have some problems. That's the size of the impactor that we think led to the mass extinction that let us be here today giving this talk. Um, they are utter, utter devastation, super, super bad. Um, they happen every few hundred million years, we think. Uh, but we think the objects that are big enough to do that, you know, there's not too many, there's only four. We think we've found all of them, so we're, we're in the clear for that. It's these middle kind of categories that um, are, are kind of interesting for our purposes. Um, one kilometer uh, is big enough, we think, to cause possible collapse of civilization. Um, we think we found most of those, so we think we're okay. Um, so then it's this middle category, which is much, much bigger than what happened at Chelyabinsk. Um, we think they happen every 25,000 years. So on our lifetimes, we are probably OK. Uh, but we've only found about half of them. So you know, if you've been to, to Vegas or Atlantic City or anywhere and you put your money on, on a roulette wheel, you might think that you know, your number's not going to come up, your number's not going to come up. Sometimes your number comes up. So um, there's some impetus not just to continue the search to find these, but to come up with some, something to do about it if we did find something coming our way. Oh, and I guess we had two more to come down. Uh, so this is where DART comes in. And I might be about to hand this off to Andy. I don't know. I might have uh, one or two more slides. So, okay. Um, not quite. So there are four, 
things that we think we could do if we found an asteroid that was incoming today. Um, these haven't all been tested, although I guess one more of them has been tested since the last time I gave this slide. Um, this, this plot here on the right shows that depending on the warning time and depending on the size of the object, what we think would be the most appropriate response. Uh, something small, in fact, like Chelyabinsk size, civil defense is what we think we would do. We'd say, hey, guess what? There's going to be something incoming to your city, but it's cool, it's small. Uh, when you see the big flash, you've got like 90 seconds to get away from the windows. We'll replace your windows. That's going to be much cheaper than sending a mission, right? Um, the next option is a nuclear deflection. This is what you'd see in the movies. Um, this is more suited, we think, for large objects, objects that maybe we have less warning time. Nuclear devices are the most powerful tools in our toolbox. Um, testing them is against international law, uh, as some of us were talking about in, in the reception there. Um, but there's, there's no question, it's the biggest, the biggest bang that we have. Um, for, for smaller issues, we have a, an option called the gravity tractor, uh, which is very elegant. Basically, this deals, uh, this, this takes advantage of the fact that all masses attract all other masses. So you send a very, very massive spacecraft, um, and you use the mass of your spacecraft to attract the asteroid. Since you can control the, your spacecraft, you just kind of scooch your, your spacecraft where you want it, kind of slowly using its gravity to, to pull the asteroid behind it. Um, as you might imagine, this is really suitable for, to, when you've got time, when you've got a lot of time, and when you're looking at kind of small objects, that's what this is best suited for. And then the last one is a kinetic impactor, which is what DART is, uh, was, and is very simple to understand. You take your spacecraft, you ram it into an asteroid, you use the momentum that you've added to the asteroid to move its orbit uh, so it no longer intersects the Earth. And we think this is kind of our second most powerful technique, at least as of now. Um, and so this is why we wanted to test it. Uh, the Defending Planet Earth study by the National Academy of Sciences endorsed the idea that this is, this is what we think we can test easily. This is what we think is worth testing. So um, DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. The, all the words matter. The double asteroid uh, piece is what we're talking about here. This was, uh, you know, Andy, Andy Chang uh, came up with this idea. So um, there's a few different things that go into this. So the conventional wisdom in the community is that contrary to what you see in the movies, you don't want to send your plucky group of, of oil rig folks to go dig a giant hole and plant a nuclear weapon and, and then blow your thing to smithereens. Um, for the most part, you don't want to disrupt an object. You want to keep it in one piece and just move it as one piece because if you blow it into a million pieces, now you have to keep track of a million pieces and some of those might still hit the Earth. Uh, asteroids typically move around the sun at something like 30 kilometers a second. So when you put those two things together, you've got something moving at 30 kilometers a second. You want to kind of poke it at to change the speed by a centimeter per second or so. And now you need to measure the difference between 30 kilometers a second and 29.999999999 kilometers a second. Uh, we think usually um, you'd need a second spacecraft sitting there to do that. And that doubles your cost, and who, who wants to double your cost if you don't have to? So um, the big innovation here that Andy realized is that a lot of asteroids have satellites. And uh, this is an animation of a radar data taken from an asteroid satellite system uh, called uh, I think the main body is called Moshup and the small body is called Squanet or, or vice versa. But um, instead of the satellite moving around, the, uh, the object moving around the sun at 30 kilometers a second, this satellite is moving around the main body at 15 to 30 centimeters a second. So if you poke it at a centimeter per second and it's only moving 15 to 30 centimeters per second to start with, that's easy to measure. Um, and then the, the second part of that is that if you have the right line of sight, uh, you can see a change in the brightness of the system. And I think I have a slide on this later. If not, Andy does. Someone has a slide, uh, but I'll, a spoiler. Uh, if you have the right line of sight, you can see the brightness of the system change as the moon moves behind and as the moon moves in front. And that lets you just make the measurements from the Earth. Um, so DART falls here. We've The Dimorphos was about 
this size. Obviously, we didn't really have warning time exactly, but it falls right where you might think that you would want to use this technique. Uh, so this is my last slide. This, uh, and I know Andy will show this slide again. This basically shows what we did with Dart. We launched in November 2021. Uh, we arrived uh, very rapidly at Dimorphos on September 26th. Uh, we've been making measurements uh, of what of the aftermath from Earth. We carried a CubeSat uh, that was donated or contributed by the Italian Space Agency. Um, here's our here's our body of, in question, Dimorphos, 160 meters, orbiting Didymos, 780 meters, with a little over one kilometer between them. All right, now I'm happy to hand this over to Andy Cheng. Dart mission, as Sandy said. We targeted the moon of the binary system. We hit it with the spacecraft intentionally, purpose being to change the orbit of the moon around the primary. And I think Andy's going to talk more about that specifically. Okay. Um, I want to mention that we actually carried, here we go, carried an Italian CubeSat called Licia Cube. It's a suitcase, a small suitcase sized spacecraft. It was the first Italian deep space mission ever. So it was a contribution from the Italian Space Agency to DART. And I will say more about that, but they, did, they, they got some fantastic results. OK. OK, so what is DART all about? OK, why did we, why did we smash the perfectly good spacecraft into an asteroid. Okay, so yes, we, that was one of our main objectives is exactly to do that. We have to hit the asteroid. We want to change the binary orbit period. I'm not gonna say, I think Andy will come back and show you more about that. We want to use ground-based telescopes, not a second spacecraft, but ground-based telescopes to measure the change in the orbit period. Okay. And I will focus more on this so we want to understand what happened. We want to characterize what beta is about. Beta is about the amount of momentum. So how hard a push, how much deflection resulted from the impact. That's something we want to know because if we ever are in a situation where there's an asteroid coming toward Earth, we want to make it not hit the Earth and we have to know how hard we have to hit it. So what do we have to do? How much of a what size nuclear weapon or what size kinetic impactor or how many of those do we need to make it miss the Earth? You don't want to put in too much. To, you don't want to, de to destroy the target. You also don't want to move a little bit, not enough, and it still hits the Earth. Okay, so we need to actually measure and understand how much of an impulse uh, we put into the target asteroid with the DART impact. Why is this not a trivially simple problem that you just conserve the momentum so the spacecraft comes in, brings in a certain amount of momentum, and that's the momentum you transfer to the target. The reason it's not is because there's, there's a, you, you, you form a crater, you, you basically blow material off the asteroid. And so that, since the ejecta from the impact are directed back in the direction from which you came, that gives you an increased transfer of momentum. And the last thing is, okay, so the more ejecta, the faster it comes back at you, the more of the momentum transfer is. And of course, it's, it's, it's re so this is actually why we get very much excited about using this method, well, trying to understand what causes the amount of momentum transfer what affects the moment? It turns out the biggest effects are from the nature of the target material. So it's physical properties, it's strength, it's friction, it's internal structure, whether it has inhomogeneities in the right scale, also the, um, the topography, the basically the shape of the body, whether, the, whether you hit, as shown here, more or less orthogonally at a high impact angle to the local average surface or whether you hit on a slope. All these things matter, and so we need to understand all that. That's, that's also why we asteroid scientists are very interested, interested 
in this experiment as well for science reasons to try to learn more about the nature of these bodies because one of the best ways to do it is to hit it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let me just show some of the um, interesting simulations. This is, this is, these are simulations carried out at uh, Livermore um, with a very detailed model of the spacecraft. Um, I'm show you pictures of the spacecraft in a moment, but the spacecraft body is down here and it's two very large solar panels. I'll tell you why in a, uh, shortly. But here, the solar panels, the body, okay, so it hits. So, all right, so this is a movie, yeah, so click that, there, okay. So this is a, uh, these are SPH, um, it's, it's, it's a numerical simulation of an impact um, with a strong target, and hit the next one also, the first one will disappear. Oh no, it didn't, that's good. So you can compare a strong target on the, that side, the left side, and on the right side, a weak target, and uh, you can't read the numbers, but um, one of the main differences on the weak target, the time scale for the impact is much larger. So the crater, the, it's the same projectile in both cases, but the crater takes a, a lot longer to form, and the ejector are released over a longer time, and all of those, and those are both observable. The other thing is that the crater is much larger in the weak target, so the total amount of ejecta, as you might expect, is much larger. Again, the amount of ejecta is something we would hope to observe in the telescopic observations. The angle of the ejecta curtain relative to, say, the incident direction or the local surface, that angle, the, that angle is different for the weaker target versus the stronger target. So all of these things are interesting things that, that we will hope to be able to learn. Um, and we'll tell you more. There's another mission that will visit Didymos in 2026. That's the European HERA mission. So they will actually be able to go look for this crater that we made and study it. OK. OK. Um, so the DART spacecraft carries a number of, of, of New technologies and also important, okay, it uses an autonomous navigation system. So the spacecraft guides itself it's, it's to the target without, over the, you know, over the last eight hours of the mission, the autonomous, the spacecraft is controlling itself. We're not telling it where to go, where the target is, but the spacecraft has to figure out the target. And the interesting thing, of course, is that we are going after a, binary systems, so there's two asteroids in the field of view of the camera, which is the main sensor for the spacecraft, has to realize that its correct target is the moon, not the other guy. So the brightest, most obvious target that we want is not the one that the spacecraft should hit. So this system has to detect the two targets and decide that this is the smaller one is the one that it wants to actually hit. Okay, the camera that we use is a, it's an eight-inch camera. Um, it's a, and it's 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 an F13, whatever. Um, ion propulsion. I will not say very much about it, but there is an ion propulsion engine. We ended up not using it very much, and if you, people want to know why, we can talk about it. But um, we ended up not, not it, it, we did fire it, we did test it, operated it for two hours, and, but we did not need it to hit uh, Didymos, and so anyway, it was not used. The solar panels are interesting because you can see how large they are. They, are, they roll up like window shades, so this is their roll out solar arrays. So that allows them to be, allows them to fold up, not fold up, roll up to a very compact array, which is nice to fit inside your launch vehicle. And then the, uh, when they're fully extended, tip to tip, the spacecraft, the solar panels are 18 meters across. So it's, it's room sized, this kind of a room. Um, also, Litchi Cube is here that I mentioned, the Italian CubeSat. Um, it has a planar antenna. What is this? Okay, new type of solar array we also tested um, with, with concentrators. So it has little reflectors concentrated. 
the, the uh, sunlight and a new electronics. It's, 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 a, it's a, the, the central computer. This computer had in it the smarts that basically contained the SpartanEv software. So it was running the software that did the image processing to track the target, the correct target, which is this guy. And also command, and, and also command the uh, spacecraft. Okay, so here's a picture of it. As I mentioned, it's 18 meters from there to there. The box, the spacecraft is a box. It's a refrigerator-sized box. It's a little over, it's about two meter by two meter by two meters. Um, the camera, well, I'll show you pictures of these things. So, spacecraft at impact was 579 kilograms. Launch, launch mass was 613, I think. Okay, so what do we do when we get there? So here's the camera. Ah, wrong one. Okay, yes, the camera is there, is looking out the bottom. Well, it was the bottom when it was being in, sitting in the lab <laughs> being integrated. So this is the camera, look, looks out this side. Here's the star tracker. This is one of the antennas. Um, and this is one of the pictures. <laughs> Well, one of our test images is one of the image of a star cluster. So, it, it, you know, it's not a very exciting picture, it's just stars, but it's very nice for us. It shows the cameras beautifully in focus, and we use it for the radiometric calibration. Okay, so the camera, how ta DART actually targeted Dimorphos. So we start looking, doing optical navigation, um, nominally, the chart says 30 days out. Actually, about two weeks before that was when the first um, detections of Didymos were made by the camera. Okay, Lichia cube is released from DART 15 days out. So that's, that's, that's not shown here, but Lichia cube is released in here. And um, Lichia cube had to do, after it was kicked off from DART, um, it has to do some orbital maneuvers to separate itself because if it didn't separate itself, it would just follow Dart right in to uh, hit Dimorphos, and they don't want to do that. They did not want to do that. So they had to fire their own en rocket engines to, um, well, actually cold gas thrusters, but they had to fire their own thrusters to separate, put themselves on a different trajectory so that they would fly by uh, their target, the Didymos system, about three minutes, 167 seconds after the DART impact at a distance of 51 or so kilometers away. So, so they had to change their trajectory a little bit. And so as it says here, I will show you um, what this looks like. The pre-terminal phase, that's when the spacecraft is, that's when you turn on your smart nav. Over the last four hours, smart nav is actually steering the spacecraft. So without ground intervention. Okay, so in the last one hour before impact, we still, um, you still cannot act, well, uh, th that's about the first time that we are able to detect dimorphos because it's a binary system. It turns out that in the geometry that we're coming, approaching the system, dimorphos is actually behind Didymos immediately before that. So two hours before the impact, literally Dimorphos is on the other far side of Didymos. We cannot see it at all. We have to wait for it to come out behind the limb, move far enough away from, separate enough from Didymos, and also wait for the spacecraft to get close enough that it can be resolved as a separate body. So when that happens, of course, then SmartNav has to decide, okay, yes, I, go, I need to lock on now to, to Morphos. So it, it did that autonomously. So three minutes out only. At this point, we're starting to be able to see Dimorphos as a, well, you can see now, you can resolve something 30 pixels across. You can start to see its shape. Two minutes out. This is the final image. Is what happens is that Didymos is uh, uh, you're getting close enough now that the frame is not a, can't actually hold both bodies in it anymore. So Didymos is moving out of the frame. The smart nav system also has to point the camera, so it's trying to keep 
Once it locks on to Dimorphos, it keeps Dimorphos in the center of the frame. It, it, you know, it, it, that's what it tries to do. And then you get close enough, and the final images, you're getting 66 centimeters per second, 20 seconds out. Our final images, it turned out, were within two seconds of impact. So that's, most we'll look at those. We'll look at those. All right, in the final two minutes, SmartNav is actually turned off in the sense that it's no longer doing maneuvers. Spacecraft is just coasting to the target, but it's continuing to use its thrusters to control its pointing of the camera. So the last 500 miles approximately is you're just gliding into the target. And it's like, yes, yeah, so one of our, Mark Jensenius actually was one of our lead engineers. He was um, from a, the air defense systems part of APL. And so he was one of the, 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 the grandfathers, if you like, of the uh, SmartNav software. But anyway, his comment was that, you know, you're over Indianapolis when you stop maneuvering and then you just coast all the way in and land inside Camden Yards. I guess we all know probably. Anyway, it's the stadium in Baltimore. All right. Okay, so let's play that movie here. This is actually what smart, animating what SmartNav does. So on the left, it's your, what the in, downloaded information, um, the red circles indicate that at this time, the um, spacecraft is already locked into Dimorphos. The um, picture at lower right with the yellow square moving around, that's actually the part of the frame, the image that is downloaded. You could see Dimorphos in the middle of it. This is a spacecraft basically trying to track, keep the spacecraft, trying to keep the camera pointed at uh, Dimorphos, and the, above that are little uh, indications of when the thrusters are fired. So here we are, the spacecraft is keeping the camera, so the SmartNav has two things. It has to ha keep the camera pointed at the target and also do the trajectory correction maneuvers, the sideways firings to make, make the spacecraft hit Dimorphos. At this point, it's already no longer maneuvering. It's just controlling the spacecraft. It's just controlling the camera pointing. So you can see what's happening here. Time to impact is now only seconds. No, well, minutes rather. So here we have Didymos moving out of the frame. Now you're getting close enough. Only Dimorphos is in the frame, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So as we were this is what we wanted. As we were watching the impact day, this is what we were looking for. Because if you saw this, you knew you were going to hit. You weren't going to miss. It's impossible to miss at this point. And there you are. Okay. So that's a simulation. That's what it looked like in simulation. We'll show a movie um, also with the real images. What did it actually look like? Okay, I, did, I already mentioned that there's a, a European mission that's coming to Didymos also, that's HERA, and we have an international collaboration, it's called AIDA, uh, between the DART mission with Litchi Cube and the HERA mission. The HERA mission is also carrying two CubeSats to the uh, Didymos, one with the radar, one with spectrometers and gravity measurements, all kinds of wonderful stuff. It's going to go there and um, answer all the questions that we still have <laughs> about Didymos. Well, whatever. Okay, let me let me go on. Litchi Cube. I'll say a little thing, a little bit more about that. It, it is a cube set. It's what's called a 6U cube set. So its dimensions are shown there. It's about roughly 20 by 10 by 30 centimeters. Litchi Cube carries two cameras. One of them is a black and white camera, Leia. Now, Litchi Cube is an amazing CubeSat because it has to do some of the same things that Dart did. Um, so, a Leia camera is what it uses to point its cameras at uh, Dimorphos and Didymos as it flies by. So, it actually is going to. So, as it flies, 
it doesn't, as it flies by, it has to autonomously turn itself around to keep the cameras pointed at the target. And it did that using the Leia camera. Luke is the other camera, and um, it actually is a color imager. So it's a three color RGB imager. I already mentioned that it's flying by 167 seconds after the dart impact. That's the closest approach time and 50, well, 51, 52 kilometer distance. And actually, by, uh, they've already downlinked um, more than half of their data, so in the first week. Amazing. Pictures around the time of the impact, they're gonna, I'll show you some of the pictures they had of the ejecta. So the ejecta are very important because it's the momentum carried by the ejecta that increases, causes the increased momentum transfer to the target above the momentum carried by the spacecraft itself. So the, looking at the ejecta is something very important we need to do. Um, okay, so surface imaging, um, also seeing parts of both Dimorphos and Didymos that DART cannot see, because DART, of course, runs smack into one face, so it sees only one side of the targets. Litcha cube flies past, it will see the other side too. Okay, and looking at the plume evolution. Okay, um, just some nice pictures to look at. What's coming down from the top there is the ion engine. Um, here, ion engine. This is the DART spacecraft box. You can see its size compared to the people standing around it. Okay, here it is, ready for thermal vacuum testing. Litchi cube is not yet at, but this is a dispenser. The box here is a dispenser that will be put in there. I also showed this, here's the, this is the, the solar array. It all rolls up into these little things here. But we had to test that it could deploy, so we wanted to do, yeah, so we had to, the, the, it requires a special uh, facility to do that because, of course, the, the, the thing cannot support its own weight in Earth gravity, it's just, and so it requires a special facility to be able to actually deploy and, you know, on, on Earth. Okay, um, here's a nice picture looking up into the Draco camera, which is here the camera, we're looking up into the camera here, um, and the person taking this picture is actually lying on the floor, <laughs> putting up, so. Okay, here's a picture, yes, yeah, so this, these are the solar arrays that are rolled up here. This is one of them, there's another one on the other side. The ion engine is inside this hat, literally called a, well, hat box-like thing. Anyway, July 2021, and the Cube is delivered by now, it's in here. Shipped out to California in a truck. That's very very exciting too. Here we are in the launch pad. So the interesting thing, of course, the, uh, the here this payload fairing is this monstrous thing here, and you can see Dart size of Dart compared to the size of the payload fairing. So look, you can imagine this Dart is in here, up in there. So Dart is a very small spacecraft with a very big launch vehicle, but that's the way it worked out. So launch from Vandenberg in November. Just last November, here it was, nighttime launch, really beautiful, very exciting, really. Okay, so let me show some of the pictures. This is a movie also, so we play it. We can maybe play it more than once if we want to see it. So yes, yeah, so you can see the thing moving around, you know, bobbling up and down as, as the spacecraft pointing. So the spacecraft is already locked into Morvos. All right, Didymos goes out of the field of view. Here comes Demorphos. There, okay. And this is the final image. It's only partially returned before the spacecraft met its end. And so, yes, it's appropriately blood red. <laughs> um, Okay, do we want to show that again? Yes. yes, let's look at that again. Okay, um, 
make a few additional comments. This image is actually flipped from the images that are oriented the normal way that you look at them with astronomers would say north up and east to the left. This is the other way around. It's just, uh, again, it's the direction from NASA to release the images this way. Um, in this picture, north, okay, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> yeah, so these, these pictures, so in this picture, north is actually, this is the north pole of the asteroid. Now, it turns out this asteroid is like many, is like many near-Earth asteroids in that um, its rotation pole is roughly aligned with ecliptic north-south, except that it's, it's pointing toward the south, ecliptic south, where you have the cursor. That, that is the direction of the pole. And also toward the upper right is the direction toward the asteroid north in this image. Okay, yeah, so these are some of the released Lichicute images. So you see where the, anyway, the, the images are not oriented the same way. And in both cases, the bigger object you see is Didymos, and then you see the plume with the filamentary structures um, off of Dimorphos. I'm not sure, it's possible that you see a little corner of Dimorphos, I can't point it out, in the image on the left. Yeah. Okay, and same thing, the, the image on the left here is actually a blow up of one of the previous images, and then the image on the right, it's at a slightly different time. Again, um, the, okay, if you, as you're looking at it, the large uh, overexposed blob uh, to the lower left, that's Didymos, and then there's the filamentary plume on the right. Okay, so um, yeah, just to kind of finish the thought here, um, this is material coming coming off of um, Dimorphos after the impact and heading off into space. So this is, if you've seen craters on the moon like Tycho um, that have these rays, we think this is basically the same kind of thing where you have the impact, you have material um, coming off um, in, in this particular pattern. So um, that kind of ties in uh, a little bit to some of what we've seen from the telescopes from Earth. So um, this just quickly shows this is what astronomical data looks like. It's it's uh, kind of a, a negative, so to speak, so the stars are, are dark and the sky is bright. You should be able to see something moving. Um, if you can't, we put a box around it. The box does not appear in, in you know, in real life out there. Um, but this, this is what uh, asteroids look like when they're discovered. This was discovered in 1996. Um, this is what it's looked like more recently. Hopefully you can see that one without a box. But if you can't, we put a box on this one too. Um, so this was observations from just earlier this summer from Arizona. Um, and this is the kind of data that we take um, with the telescope. This is just a whole bunch of images uh, over the course of a night. You can see satellites and various other things moving past. Um, and on each image we can measure the brightness and then compare it to the brightness of the one before, et cetera, and, and be able to pull out when Dimorphos is moving in front and behind. Um, this, um, for those of you that have telescopes at home, uh, turns out that Didymos might be interesting to look at right now. Um, so it's, this is uh, the path of Didymos across the sky, where of course uh, they're getting close to October 2022, 15th October 2022. It's in the southern part of the sky, so it's not super observable in the northern part of the sky that we see right now, but it will be getting better. Um, and uh, basically it is, if you do have your own telescope and you do have a camera attached to it, you might be able to get some cool images uh, coming up. For the professional campaign that we have, uh, we have bigger telescopes, we have them all over the world, um, and in fact we uh, have, um, well that's fine, we have uh, telescopes on all seven continents um, that, uh, that are involved. We have telescopes in space, HST, JW, and uh, the Lucy spacecraft also took images. Uh, it's in the neighborhood. It's going to be doing an Earth flyby, uh, gravity says pretty soon. And so they, uh, they also took images. Um, and here's kind of what they saw. So these images are from uh, just at the time of impact. Um, all three of these were taken from South Africa. 
Um, and just moments after the incoming movie that Andy showed, uh, the team Slack space uh, lit up less than two minutes later from people in Africa saying, hey, we think it's getting brighter. So it was, it was amazing instant uh, gratification. I mean, like, you could, you, it was really within, within two minutes. So um, again, the one on the left is, is kind of a negative compared to the others, but uh, there was this initial uh, puff that comes off. We're still trying to decide on the team um, what specifically that is. There's some discussion about, um, and I think this has been out there enough that I can say this, some discussion about whether that has to involve extra propellant that we didn't use, or whether that's something that could just be done from vaporizing rock on the impact. So that, that stuff is moving pretty fast. Um, but then subsequent to that, it's, it stayed bright. Um, these next images are from JWST and HST. This shows you the scale of, of the next couple images I'm gonna show relative to one of those things you just saw. So this is gonna be inner, um, close in, um, and it's going to be um, after that first initial wave passed. So um, let's see, I think, uh, so these are both, um, right, it's Hubble and Webb. Both Hubble and Webb have features that are in every image, no matter what they're looking at, just because of the structure of how the mirror is mounted. On Webb, you kind of get this six-pointed star, um, and on Hubble, you get a cross. But other than that cross and that six-pointed star, the other stuff in there is debris from the impact. So I think we have, uh, first there's a, an animation uh, of um, Hubble, so it gets bright and you can see these, well you can see it on that screen better, but you can see material moving out uh, from, from that uh, central, central condensation on, on uh, Didymos, or the system. And then on the left, here's kind of the same thing basically with, with uh, with Hubble. So the uh, longer term plan is to be able to take these images to put them together with Leech Cube to say, okay, what streamer happened when? When did, you know, what we see really close up with Leech Cube, then follow it out with these, and then be able to say, okay, what else do we see from these other telescopes? So these um, have been released. The one on the left was uh, taken from Chile, just released a few days ago. Um, I don't remember when the one on the right was taken. The one on the right, uh, if you're not used to these images, might look funny because unlike those other images, I, those other movies I showed where they were keeping the stars still and letting the asteroid move, in that one on the right, they were keeping the asteroid still and, they, and the stars kind of chugged along. So that's what's going on on the right. But you can see that the material that was kicked off of uh, Didymos, um, it, it's, it, didn't, it didn't, you know, disappear. It's, it's mass. It's gotta, gotta go somewhere. Uh, and in this case, uh, the small material gets swept behind just like a typical comet. So the stuff coming off to the upper right in that left image and to the lower right on the right image um, is small particles that, that are getting swept back by solar radiation pressure. Uh, the tail um, coming off in that direction is about 10,000 kilometers long. Uh, and then the material off to the left there on, on the left image and kind of up to the top in that right image we think is kind of the initial larger material that got blown out. So as time goes on, at least in, in comets, the way this works, um, is that the solar radiation pressure moves stuff back. It takes longer to move bigger particles than smaller particles. So we'll be watching this over coming weeks and months and be able to say, okay, now there's more material in the back. The, the stuff in the front is less. Here's what we think the size frequency distribution, as we call it, is. Here's how many small things. Here's you know, the fraction of micron sized particles and millimeter sized particles and whatever. So this, this has been really, um, I won't say unexpected, but I'll say something we weren't counting on. Uh, it's one thing also uh, just viscerally to look at numbers on a page and say, oh yeah, okay, we're gonna make this much ejecta, it's gonna, whatever. But to see it, like what that means in images is a whole different thing. So uh, work to be done, this again is this image uh, from Leech Cube. Um, obviously we are gonna continue observations. We have, um, 
we have this uh, announcement coming out in a few days that's going to say what the uh, period change is. It's going to be reported to some level of precision, uh, but we have to report it to a seven second precision to meet the NASA requirements, so that's going to take us a little while yet. Uh, we need to um, determine the shape models for Didymos and Dimorphos. I don't know if you remember that movie na na animation I showed right at the start and some of the other things that we've shown along the way. Didymos doesn't quite kind of look like we thought it did, um, just in shape. It's, it's a, little bit, uh, a little bit more squashed. Uh, Dimorphos, we really had no information, so that was a guess. So we need to work out, now that we have the real shapes, what, um, how that affects uh, some of these other things. And again, really, we've, we've just kind of got a lot to do. We've published a lot of papers. We've got a lot more papers to publish. Andy showed this uh, to start. We can already check off two of these. We hit the Morphos um, during that close approach. Uh, every model we have run showed that as long as we hit it, we will make a change of at least 73 seconds. So maybe I'm jumping the gun just a little bit uh, by saying that we got that one, but we, we got that one. Um, and so it's these other two that now are going to be the focus of, of what we're doing over the next few weeks and months. So uh, this is, I think, my last slide. Um, in a summary of sorts, we did successfully impact the Morphos. Um, the Draco camera retur returned thousands of images of the Didymo system. I think it returned 200,000 images total. Most of them not of the Didymo system, uh, but it was taken an image per second, uh, and in that last hour or so, that's you know thousands of thousands of images. Uh, Leechy Cube is in the process of downlinking its images to Earth. Um, as we've said, it's only about the size of a cereal box, and so its antenna is even smaller, so it's got, got some work to do. Uh, and again, all the models that we've done prior to the impact show that any impact at all is going to give us at least the required change in the orbit period. Uh, so work is ongoing. And with that, um, oh, I guess I do have one or two more slides. So this shows, you know, the investigation team was big. Right? Um, we have a lot of people involved. It's a very international group because it's a very international problem. Um, and uh, we have team members from, from all over the world, from the six uh, permanently inhabited continents, I think. Um, and uh, you know, here's a picture of some of us. Uh, I'm off to the right. Uh, Nancy Chabot, our coordination lead, is off to the left. Andy Cheng is in Cape Cod at this time, so we're just we're not in this picture, I believe. But um, are you? Oh, did uh, someone added you? <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. That's right. We photoshopped you in. That's right. Um, although the spacecraft is gone, we still have uh, the mission goes on because if only because we we are still here and we're still doing this work. Um, so you can still follow us in various places on on various social media. I'm looking for the social media coordinator. There she is back there. Um, and. Our outreach page still has some things in case you're interested. There are 3D printable model instructions on that page. Uh, there's the augmented reality experience. There's, we are required uh, to call it a toy brick model uh, specifically. So there are instructions to how to build a dart out of toy bricks. Um, I guess host a watch party is not relevant anymore. Um, but there you go. So thank you for your time. And uh, we're happy to take your questions. So we have time for some questions. Bob Terry. <laughs> Yay, I remember. Right. <laughs> okay, uh, Andy? <laughs> They're both Andy. There's Andy R and Andy C. And, and the R. <laughs> In the pictures where you first show them and the, and the, 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 the target is moving along and the impact, impact uh, comes and stuff splays out and looks like it comes both spalls off the back and maybe comes around the front as well. Now. When that impact is coming, isn't it going, isn't it supposed to be moving against the motion of uh, DeMarfos in its orbit? Is, uh, is that the end of the question or is there more to the question? And then, uh, it, uh, could you tell me which, how, how much the speed of DeMarfos in its orbit compares to the, the, the way it walks across the screen? Uh, so um, there's, there's a few things going on, so Didymos, Dimorphos is moving around Didymos at, I think it's 17 centimeters per second. Uh, the impact speed of DART is six kilometers a second, so right. it's a very small. Um, the Didymos system is moving around the sun 
Um, and that's what we see against the stars. Okay. So uh, we've we sat and puzzled and made, and then on top of that, um, as Andy kind of alluded, the north pole of the Didymo system is the opposite direction from the north pole of the celestial sphere. So, okay. um, so we we sat down and we puzzled it out, and we we until we were satisfied that those. Images made sense, but but yes, we, we do think they make sense. Sure. Um, and then because of because of the nature of those of that first ejecta, um, again, this is a matter of, of discussion and ongoing. There's some thought that it might be because, that it might be vapor, in which case it would be a hemispheric thing, and so just come out in all directions, right. not a hemispheric thing, whatever that would be a the dual hemispheric thing, a mono. Uh, a sec a yeah. second question. Are you going to put this into, well, Paul showed us the uh, asteroid game from, from <laughs> JPL. He always has, a, has an asteroid game where you send rockets to, to knock an asteroid around. Can you uh, add this yeah, Paul, Paul's aware, certainly aware of our stuff. and we, we have a few JPL folks, so I'm sure if that happens, it'll, it'll happen whether or not we want it to. Is the motion that you saw there actually is, most, is the motion of Didymos? Yes. Okay, the direction the DART spacecraft came from is pretty much opposite to the, the initial expansion you saw of the shell coming off. So yeah, DART coming in, shell comes out. Uh, uh, my name is AJ Kutari. I'm a guest here today. Um, how did you know what is the momentum of the smaller satellite and how, um, what was the ratio of the momentum of the uh, orbiting um, satellite to that of the DART spacecraft? Uh, the, we uh, estimate the mass of, uh, of Dimorphos. Uh, we had a, an idea of what that size was prior to the impact because uh, we could measure that both from how much the light dropped off when it would pass in front and pass in back. And also we had some radar data from 2003 that um, it was only a few pixels, but at least it at least gave us a size and it agreed. So given, given that size, given a typical density for the material we, we think it's, it is, um, that's, that's how we got the, the momentum, the mass, and the, thus momentum of Dimorphos, at least an estimate. And then uh, for DART itself, right, I mean, we, we, that, that's, that was straightforward. What was the ratio? The, the ratio of the, um, the momentum of the DART spacecraft and of Dimorphos, Dimorphos is, you know, gigantic compared to Didymos. It's 80 or 100 times larger, so the mass, kind of no matter what it's made of, the mass of Dimorphos is going to be, you know, a million times more. I think the, I think the mass of Dimorphos is a 5 billion kilometers, I think we decided, so uh, more or less. So. Uh, red microphone. Gee, I'm a member. Uh, what was the main lessons you learned that will affect future missions like this? Oh, good question. <laughs> yeah, so the main thing is we, 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 we learned that we can do it. It does deflect the asteroid, yes. And also when we get the measurements of, you know, exactly how much momentum we transferred and be able to relate that to things we know about the asteroid, how large it was, what its structure is, what its composition is, and so on, then um, we'll have better understand, better, better predictions, better way to model the results of a kinetic impact on another object. Question from YouTube. Eric, who's not a member, asks, what method of planetary defense will be tried next? Could you what was that? Yeah, could what, you mem what, what uh, technique of planetary defense will be tried next? I assume tested next. Yes. Yeah, um, I, I think the the official answer is that um, we, we're not NASA, so uh, NASA NASA will decide. I I think um, a, a different answer <laughs> that also is correct is that uh, China is thinking about testing. A, a kinetic impactor mission of their own. At least they have they have announced those sorts of plans. So that is probably the next one. And then the the 
There were thoughts in the past that as part of the human exploration program that the um, gravity tractor technique, which I mentioned, uh, could be tested as part of that, but uh, when the asteroid uh, when, redirect mission. Redirect mission, yeah, it's unfortunate the name was so close. Uh, when, when the asteroid redirect mission uh, was uh, canceled, that so did the, the test of the uh, gravity tractor. Uh, hi, Michael Hammerschlag, I'm not a member. Um, you must have known almost immediately, like 11 hours or so, how much this changed uh, the, the actual orbit of it. Uh, what's the secret? Uh, and, I mean, it, it hasn't changed <laughs> since that really first few seconds of impact. Um, so in, for your first one, uh, you might have seen that when there was that big poof, the whole system got brighter by a factor of five or six. Most of what was there was dust. The dust was obscuring the signal that we needed to, to measure. Right, we're measuring the, 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 the change in brightness that we were talking about is like a 10, when, it's, when everything's clear, it's like a 10% drop. So the whole thing got brighter by some huge amount and it took a while for the ejecta to clear to the point that we could see, see and believe the dips uh, from, from multiple telescopes, from multiple techniques. Um, for the for the second one, I guess, uh, and I, I'm sorry, India. Like I said, I'll, I'll save us from ourselves here. Uh, order of decades, yeah, that, a decade, that, maybe maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The, the magnitude of the velocity change that you need to make an asteroid miss is typically on the order of a centimeter per second, and, and in this, this case, yeah, the, the kind of number we're talking about is a 10-year kind of number. Yeah, basically, it's if you think about it, the problem, right? The problem is when the Earth and the asteroid want to be at the same place at the same time. So, you need to speed up or delay an asteroid by seven minutes, because it takes seven minutes for the Earth to pat to travel its own diameter in space. So, if you've got if you've got the time, it doesn't take take very much to do it. Yeah, but then there's other options. You know, if in the event that um, you, had a, you had an asteroid coming at, you, the, you would probably send more than one impactor. You would probably want to actually accomplish the deflection in stages because you wouldn't, you'd have some uncertainty in terms of exactly how far you'd be able to move it. So you want to actually not put it all in one go, you know, just put it in, sort of titrate the result. Yeah, John Downing, I'm a member here. And I'm just wondering if we're not opening up a can of worms because if you can make an asteroid that's going to hit the Earth, miss the Earth, you can make an asteroid that's going to miss the Earth, hit the Earth, preferably in somebody else's country. <laughs> I just wonder if you'd given any thought to that. Well, that's something that was actually a big concern. And in fact, we had to do a very detailed and careful analysis to show that, in fact, the DART experiment would have zero chance of making Didymos hit the Earth. I understand, but it, 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 it is an interesting it, it is an interesting question. Yes, so that's one of the problem. That's one of the reasons why we want to understand how much deflection you would actually get if you were to put a warhead, if you had a nuclear explosion in front of an asteroid, or if you hit it with a kinetic impact, or precisely because if you move at the wrong amount, you could actually create a hazard or make it worse. Yeah, and in, in terms of where I think you might be going, I know Carl Sagan was concerned that this could be weaponized, and maybe that's where you're going. Um, I think, personally, I think it would be kind of a, a cartoon villain show-off move, because it's not, if you, if you got the time and the energy and the, and the time frame to say, 50 years from now, we're gonna, we're gonna start this thing so that 50 years from now, this thing just happens to hit there. Um, I think that requires the technology and the luck required in finding the right asteroid to do that, you've got a lot better ways of, of causing the mayhem you want to cause on shorter timescales much cheaper. Hi, I'm David Thurston, a guest. Thank you both. It's very exciting. I apologize if I miss this, but do all the asteroids that you would want to target have moons? About one out of every six. Can you expand on that? What do you do with the ones without moons? About one out of every six asteroids is a, is a binary system in the near Earth population. But yeah, but this technique doesn't require a moon. We just used the asteroid with the moon as an easy way to validate the technique, but it could be used on any asteroid. 
Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, they picked this because it's easier to measure a change in the orbital period of a moon mm -hmm. satellite system to detect the amount of deflection and the effects of the impact. Yes. So I have a quick question I want to sneak in here. So we talk a lot about changes in the velocity and mm -hmm. momentum, but not much about changes in the trajectory. So I'm curious about... Well, they're related. You, you don't have to really deflect it much of an angle to... That's right. ...to make sure it misses. That's right. It's well, yeah, the, the math, the way the math works out, as I understand it, it's not, it's not really like a goalie kind of, kind of sweeping very, away. Yeah, it's, but you it need is like much more one the, inch, right? Yeah, it's much more that you, you want to change the speed, and by changing the speed, you're changing the orbit. Yeah, so basically, as Andy said, you just change the, the time that you get close it's to Earth to so that Earth is yeah. past. Uh, so I'm Suzanne, and I was invited here by Cameo. Um, and I'm curious, how much, what was the budget here? How much are we spending to, to do this kind of project? Yeah. And then also, what was the timeline here? How often were we worried about this kind of a, uh, an impact potentially occurring? Okay, the, okay, so two questions. DART mission, $330 million. That's including the launch vehicle. That's everything. $330 million. And um, how often it, DART, uh, no, the, the 140, 150 meter size bodies, we're talking 20, 25,000 years. Hi, Don Bosco, guest. Uh, I'm sorry if this was already addressed. I showed up super late. But um, the composition of the asteroid, um, did you have an idea if it would squish in like a marshmallow or splat like a rock? Are most asteroids the same type of composition? And did this affect your calculations and future calculations? It's a lot of questions. Why don't you take some of them? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we know uh, from meteorites uh, that hit the Earth, which are pieces of asteroids. Um, there are particular kinds that are very, very common, and then we look at their reflectance spectrum, we look in space, right, and we can say, okay, if you take this rock into the lab, it looks the same in these wavelengths as it does, as this type of asteroid does in space. So uh, Didymos, uh, we knew, was a type that was uh, actually very similar to the, uh, to the uh, impactor that hit Chelyabinsk. Uh, in Siberia about 10 years ago. It's very similar to the asteroid Itakawa, which was visited by the Japanese. Um, so we knew it was rock. We didn't necessarily know whether it was more like a big pile of gravel or a solid rock. Um, uh, and those would react differently, but we did have a good good sense that it was, it was rock, it was not metal, it wasn't clay, it wasn't, you know, something like that. Another question over here from our physicist. Uh, my name's Scott Matthews, I'm a member. Um, my question, unfortunately, doesn't really have that much to do with DART. But um, what, what can you tell me about the size of Chelyabinsk, Chelyabinsk compared to, um, uh, what was the other big Russian one? Tunguska. 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 Smaller. And um, Chelyabinsk is smaller. Yes. And. Like, like, what did we learn from Chelyabinsk about the butterfly pattern um, and how that relates to Tunguska and whether this would be relevant to other asteroid impacts? Well, I, I don't know what you would say about that. The butterfly pattern comes about if you have a fairly oblique impact. So that, that's established um, both from, yeah, boy, you can see it in simulations, you can also see that in laboratory experiments. I don't think the uh, Tunguska impact was that way, though. I, I, think, I think one of the general lessons that we've learned over the past 30 years, um, right, when, when Leonard Nimoy would come on in search of and talk about Tunguska, it was, well, this couldn't be an impact because there was no crater and... and an I think, airburst. Right, right. We've learned that even rocks, you know, that, that when a 50-meter impactor hits, it's not one big slab of 50 meters of rock, that it's probably a whole bunch of, you know, chair-sized and gravel and, you know, maybe bigger things coming in all at once and then reaching some level in the atmosphere where, where it, it blows up. So um, I think Chelyabinsk um, was similar. Um, you know, we have a lot of cameras looking at a lot of these fireballs and stuff. I think that if you remember what 
Dimorphos looked like, a big pile of gravel kind of flying through. So I think that's um, informing, you know, what what impactors are like, and then how we might best, you know, some some techniques are going to be. When people talk about, well, why don't you just put a put a big grappling hook on it and tow it out of the way, or put a, <laughs> you know, put a big rocket on it, which is is, is super obvious, and and I don't mean to make fun of people for doing that, but. Um, you know, if, if you think it's one big rock, then okay, look, it's one big rock. You put your harness on it, you take the spin out of it, you rock it out of the way. But once it's, well, it's 50 meters worth of bits that are this big, it becomes a whole different, a whole different problem. Red microphone, Al. My name is Al Ehrlich. I am a member of the society. And when the mission was launched, what, what was the goal? Was the idea to discover what there was to discover? or to find out what, what the media was made of, or to study the debris field? Because mm. anything you discover about the movement of the meteor is going to depend on the character of the rock. And so what you learn specifically, not generally, but specifically on this test is not going to tell you how a different meteor will move unless you somehow know what it's, how it's made. So, so what was, yeah. at the beginning of the mission, what was the idea? At the beginning of the mission, we set up those four uh, level one requirements that both of us showed. So starting off with hit the moon. Just to see if you could it. Yes, we'll just show that we could do it. Show that you can hit the moon. Um, anyway, so, so those four requirements change the period by a certain amount measure the amount of the period change, and then also determine the momentum transfer and you know, so related to things. Correlate all the factors, the debris field with the change yes, of exactly. momentum, with the change of velocity. Yeah, so those, are, those were the, 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 that was when we yeah, first formulated the mission. It, NASA requires you, of course, to actually say formally what the requirements, what the mission will do. So what will NASA get for the whatever hundreds of millions of dollars they put into it. So okay, so it was open-ended, so to speak. Oh, yeah, so that was said at the very beginning. Those are what the level one requirements so, are. So a follow-up question to that is, mm -hmm. of the asteroids and other objects that you guys have studied, because you were talking about how you know about all the really big ones and you know about 50% of it, how much difference is there in their compositions to the best of your knowledge? And is this particular one uh, characteristic and of what you expect to see of many of the others? Are there going to be a wide variety? Some are hard, some are soft. Um, the uh, most meteorites, like overwhelmingly most meteorites, are this kind of, of are, are called ordinary chondrites. That's the, the geochemical term. It doesn't matter what it means or doesn't mean. It's ordinary chondrites. Um, and they're, 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 they're rock. They're rock with little bits of metal. Um, when we look at the uh, objects in the near-Earth population, most of them look like they are also ordinary chondrites. The ones that uh, were visited by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft and by the Hayabusa-2 spacecraft are different, and they were chosen because they're different, because they're unusual, because they have particular geochemical characteristics that, that were, were very interesting in ways that ordinary chondrites, ordinary, uh, don't really have. Um, from the point of view of this is a planetary defense mission, we don't want to go to some weirdo, you know, object. Uh, iron meteorites are um, very impressive. You go to the Hayden Planetarium, you go wherever, you got these big hunks of metal. They're also very rare in the, me in the, in the meteorite collection. They're rare in near-Earth space. So Dimorphos has that going for it, that compositionally it's, it's very, very common. Did you see anything in the plume, or not you, but the Hubble and JWST and the other observatories that allowed them to determine what the chemical makeup is and were there any surprises, or is it too early for that? Um, I think it's a little too early. We're seeing some things. Uh, we have some folks that were doing spectroscopy um, during, before, during, and after, the, or the mm -hmm. days before, during, and after. Um, so looking at the dust composition, um, and and I think that will you know people they're working on that they'll they'll publish that I'm sure sometime in the next couple of months. Um, the NASA Swift uh, UV space telescope 
um, was looking at the time. Some folks mm -hmm. who were not associated with the team said, oh, hey, we've got time on this UV telescope. Let's let's go do it. So they're they're working independently. They'll they'll publish what they're going to publish. We had time on the this uh, sub millimeter array in Chile. They're looking to see you know uh, if there was material that they could identify in the plume. So so mm -hmm. folks are very interested. Um, that that stuff is not not ready for prime time. Uh, there's a lot of work okay. to be done. Can't say. We have a question from Timo from the Netherlands. Um, Timo is wondering. Would this particular asteroid have burned up entirely in the Earth's atmosphere if it were to impact Earth, or would it partially burn up? What would the effects be if it were to have impacted Earth? It, it would hit the ground. It would, <laughs> it would make would a big crater. Ground. It would take out a uh, region that's the size of a major metropolitan region, so like the entire area inside the Beltway or something like that. The entire Netherlands. Maybe not the entire Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> Timo, you should be asleep. What are you doing awake? <laughs> <laughs> we're glad you're up ask a kind of open-ended question about. So you have an incredible number of collaborators or people who are participating in this. Mm -hmm. what is, what's involved in getting JWST and Hubble to look at this you particular have to write proposals. event? Hmm? Proposals. So everybody was sufficiently interested in this that they approved the time. Mm -hmm. so how many observatories altogether do you have as part of the program? Um, we have, you know, we counted at some point. Um, certainly over 30. Wow. Um, and then there are there were lots of people who were interested who you know would contact us and say, hey, I was looking from you know my 12-inch telescope in the UAE, and you know let me know if this is going to be interesting or useful. So some of the things like to determine the period change, we need pretty precise data to do that. So we haven't gotten a lot of we haven't seen volunteer data that ha that reaches that level, uh, but. Um, to do things like to study the the ejecta field, how that evolved, uh, I could certainly see using some of these these folks that kind of contacted us. Hello, Jared McQueen. I'm a member. Uh, so from what you told us, there's a rendezvous mission sometime in the near future. I'm curious to know how far in the future was that, and what do you expect to see? Do you expect to see something surprising? Do you expect to see? something that your simulation probably predicted, or are you secretly hoping for something different? I'm sure it will be surprised. This is the HERA mission. It will arrive in late 2026, and it will start the, uh, sci its science operations actually in early the first few months of 2027. And the main thing we hope to, that, that they will be able to actually find the crater that DART made, tell us how big it was, how deep it was, and things like that. Um, also studying, what, we didn't talk about this, but the DART impact will have uh, changed the rotational motions of the moon. So, so not only do you change its orbit, but you also change the way it's spinning. And it will be able to characterize that. I think Andy mentioned, actually you could see if you were, if you, if you looked very carefully, you, you would have seen in the images, both of the objects, both Dimorphos and Didymos, have shapes that, that we didn't expect. So that uh, I, I, I can't I, I can't talk about the details, but if you go back, <laughs> go back and look, you'll you'll, you'll know what. I, if you just just look at the pictures that um, we showed for, from our simulations and drawings, in the you know in most of the slides, and then compare that to the actual pictures, you'll see they don't match up very well. So the other thing they'll be able to do is to look at to make the detailed measurements of the sizes and the shapes of the entire bodies. And also look at the you know the boulders and other geological features that are seen on these bodies. So yes, there's a lot of exciting things that they'll be doing. As I mentioned, also the Hera mission is carrying a gravity experiment. They're carrying a ground-penetrating radar. They're carrying um, hyperspectral imagers. So all that is going to happen also. That's in orbit, yes. And the CubeSats, uh, one of them, I think they'll both land. They have, they're carrying two CubeSats, and they're both going to land on the body. Red microphone. Hello, my, my name is Renee Willems. I'm a guest. Um, you talk a lot about studying the debris field. Um, you also mentioned that the plume that uh, came from Dimorphos might contain a lot of propellant that hadn't been used yet. Does that contaminate your data at all? We think so. <laughs> Contaminate the data? Not well. You see, we see it. 
I, I'm one of the ones who, who, who's of the opinion that, in fact, that early, very fast ejecta is a vapor plume and that the vapor expands out and condenses into little droplets that scatter light. You see that, so that's what the shell is. And also may have entrained some of the dust flying out at very high speed. But um, anyway, we're, we're, we're working on that. And, um, but no, it would not contaminate the data. It's in the data, <laughs> we it, think. It would, be, it would be part of the data, but we don't think it would affect the results in, in any in any sort of, yeah, certainly it, not in any sort of negative way. Right, it doesn't affect the, the other measurements, the, yeah, the period change me measurements, and also the, the imaging uh, and the evolution of the, the dust, the dust tail and the other eject, you know, the longer term evolution, the very long dust tail that, we sh that Andy showed. Um, it's, it's not affected by any of that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to the extent it's something that happened when we smacked an asteroid with a with a spacecraft, it is part of the it's part of the results of the experiment. So, how much propellant was left, and what was its mass? Do you okay, think? So you have 60, to guess. Yeah, what's the the sixty kilograms of xenon and thirty kilograms of hydrazine still on the spacecraft? And the, and the total mass of the spacecraft was five hundred and seventy nine okay, kilograms. Well, you know, if you piece your ball. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Holly. I'm a guest this evening, and thank you for the very interesting and exciting presentation. This is amazing work. Um, I am interested to learn if you're aware of or at liberty to speak about any private sector entities also working on asteroid redirection or destruction or any private public partnerships that you're involved in uh, working on the same. Thank you. I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't know of any. Um, I think um, it would be uh, convincing the, the EPA or whomever that you're going to go, you know, your private company is going to go whack into an asteroid, but really it's okay. It might be a tougher sell than NASA doing it. Um, uh, certainly there have been uh, asteroid mining companies, um, although I, f I don't know if they're all defunct or all but one are defunct. Uh, and I did. Um, I, I did work with one of them uh, kind of uh, as a consultant through APL for a little while. Um, certainly this is the sort of thing where I could imagine some of the technology would be, would be uh, interesting to those kinds of companies, you know, even, uh, you know, you don't need to use your, your smart nav to come in at 14,000 miles an hour, maybe you come in a little slower. Um, <laughs> so. The, but but a lot of the a lot of the kinds of issues one would want to solve for asteroid mining are at least um, are at least generally associated with the same kinds of things that that one might do to move an asteroid. Uh, I think the my, some of the mining companies were talking about moving things, but not that big. Yeah, no, not that big. Yeah. We have one more question from online. Seth Morris asks. It seems like it would be simpler to fold up a giant sa sail attached to an asteroid and take momentum from solar particles to move it over long periods of time. Can you speak to the feasibility of that solution? Sailing the solar wind. Yes, yes that's one of the ideas that has been talked about. Yes, in principle it can be done. I think that the actual technical engineering challenges of making it actually happen are, are immense, but anyway. I think you need a very, very large sail to oh, move yeah. that mass. Yes, it, and you might it, be better it, off, yeah, if you had means to be able to do that, you might be better off just using it as a kinetic impactor. <laughs> so with that, I thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. And before you go, a few closing remarks. The next meeting, due to my deficiencies as a program chair, I have not yet identified, but I am about to this weekend confirm who the speaker will be. Um, so we'll just pass over that one. The rest of the fall semester is um, set. So the 2,466th meeting will be on November 4th. The speaker will be Francis Housen. Francis is the Gregory Bright and Hilldale Professor of Physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He will be speaking on the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory operating in Antarctica and its results locating the sources of neutrinos in the universe. The lecture is sponsored by PSW members Brett Magarum and Eric Ennig. 
The 2467th meeting will be on November 18th. The speaker will be Tony Levy. Tony is professor and chair of electrical and computer engineering electrophysics at the University of Southern California. He will be speaking about a new technique for seeing inside anything in three dimensions called picrographic x-ray laminography. I chose this speaker because I thought pitographic x-ray laminography is too good of a title to pass up. <laughs> well, actually, a very interesting technique that allows the users to see inside integrated circuits non-destructively and understand exactly how they're made. The 2,468th meeting will be on December 2nd. The speaker will be Sean Gulick. Sean is research professor in the University of Texas Institute for Geophysics. He's co-director of the University of Texas Center for Planetary Systems Habitability. And he's associate chair of lithosphere and deep space, deep earth studies in the Department of Geological Studies, the Jackson School of Geosciences, and the University of Texas at Austin. He will be speaking about the latest on the great dinosaur extinction, which some of you will notice has a certain resonance with tonight's talk. And he will certainly be talking about what the geological record tells us about impacts and their effect on the dinosaurs and their demise. The last meeting of the fall schedule will be the 2469th meeting. On December 16th, the speaker will be Rachel Klima and another person. And Rachel is planetary geologist and director of the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium at the Johns Hopkins University APL Applied Physics Lab. She will be speaking about the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium and about going back to the moon to stay. Please check the PSW website often for up-to-date information on meetings and whether lectures will be in person or via Zoom. Actually, they're going to be in person. Before we go, let's thank tonight's crew. James Elin for the minutes, Robin Taylor at the back, nobody sees her, behind the screen. She does the video, multicast and recording, the live stream and the Zoom, and has spent most of the evening solving problems. Brett Magarum has run the soundboard. Thank you, Brett. Jared McQueen on camera one, and Connor Nixon, well, actually, it's Sam Nixon on camera two. So scratch that, it's Sam Nixon. Ann McQueen, Rosettes, and chat. Cameo Lance, our room manager and mic runner. And Bill Mitchell, who hasn't done anything yet, but will edit the video before it's posted permanently to the website. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting, the 2,464th meeting of the society. I wish everyone a good morning, an afternoon, evening, or night, wherever you happen to be. Meeting is adjourned.